this place. John, it's good to be with you, brother. Good to be with you too, John. Thanks for having me. And, uh, and welcome to Austin. Thank you. Good to be here. Good uh, to be. Dude, how, how are you feeling? Not at this stage of life, but literally this morning. How are you doing? How's your heart? <laughs> you know, my heart's a little heavy about a few things, a few personal things, but, um, but basically feeling pretty good, feeling pretty grateful for my life. Definitely feeling really grateful for the men in my life. Like I just have a really beautiful group of men around me. And, um, and that's, that's, that's gold, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, learning about your life, I, I know that uh, you didn't necessarily have a lot of great examples or models for a number of years. And then yeah. you found a group at one yeah. point that really yeah. changed your world. Yeah. And yeah. at what point in the journey, though, did you decide that you needed to flip the script and not only just get helped, but to be the helper and provide the space and develop the containers? Yeah, I. Um, so I think it was, you know, I mean, I, I you know, my dad bailed when I was quite young. Uh, both my grandfathers died when I was young, five ish. And so I was raised by all women. <laughs> and um, and. When I got sober in my late 20s, I found a group of men who met, you know, in this restaurant every day, pretty much. And, and they became sort of my home group. And I would just be with them every day for 60 minutes, eating lunch, you know, talking about life, talking about, you know, sobriety at the time. And, and, um, and those guys, you know, helped raise my daughter. My daughter played with their daughters. You know what I mean? Like they came to the hospital when that was, you know, when Clara was in the hospital, there was a time when my business um, was starting and I, I just started a new business and not this one, but a one previous to this. And, um, and uh, you know, I, 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 I needed help and they were like, we'll go to the hospital. We'll go stay with Claire. We'll go paint pictures with her. We'll go keep her company. And she was, I don't know, in her four five, six, you know? And so these guys not only became just, you know, mentors and teachers, but they really became like a, a brotherhood that held me really beautifully. And it was the first time in my life I realized like, wow, this is, I'd ever experienced that. Yeah. And they, you know, they taught me how to be a man, you know, how to be a father, how to, you know, how to run a business. Um, how to show up in life. And at some point though, I realized I wanted to do, you know, something more for lack of a better term embodied. And so, you know, just something that just felt deeper than just talking and, you know what I mean? And, and, and although the 12 step recovery is a beautiful, very, very deep spiritual practice. Um, I, I realized I wanted to do something deeper and, um, and I, uh, I found a teacher that I loved and I was like, wow, this is very much what I, you know, what I'm looking for. That's kind of a, a deep experience. And when I got into that, um, I started to about three years into that, I started to think like, wow, this is something that other men need. Um, they need to learn about what it means to be embodied. They need to learn about, you know, what a healthy masculine, you know, core feels like and looks like, you know, cause we all, we all have it. And, um, and I, and I started to do these pop-up men's groups in Santa Monica. They were very small at first and, and it was just a very slow, you know, multi-year process of just teaching men embodied, you know, practice and meditation and, uh, embodied relationship practice. And then I started to teach men and women and, um, you know, a whole thing kind of grew from there. And, and that book is kind of the culmination of of my journey of, of teaching. Yeah. Yeah. There of it is. Teaching men. Yeah. Yeah. Of teaching men. Um, and, and my own, a lot of my own experience, a lot of my own experience. Yeah. 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 I, I was, you know, reading this and feeling John, like there, there is no mistake that of why you entered my world in the, in the time and the way that you have, because th this is, this is my work. Mm -hmm. Um, meaning I'm in the work now. This yeah. is, uh, you know, I'm in process of, it, it's like, I, I keep reading what you write and I'm like, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's my inner dialogue. Most of the way through the book is oh, yes. Great, man. Yeah. So glad. So, so thank glad. you for doing all the hard work and putting <laughs> into words 
all of my feelings. Thank you, John. Oh, yeah, right on. I'm glad. I appreciate I'm glad, that. I'm glad it's helpful. I'm glad. I'm glad you relate, man. And I think most men do. I'm a pretty average guy, and you know, I've made my share of mistakes in relationship, out of relationship, in life as a father. You know what I mean? Like, and and so I, I hope a lot of guys can relate because I'm certainly not a yogi or a guru or a you know, uh, even a spiritual teacher. I'm just a guy on the path trying to yeah. live by spiritual principles. And I think you did a really well, a really great job of balancing wisdom and humility through the book. Mm. So props mm. to you on that. Thank um, you. you know, early on in the book, I, I made so many notes. I got just tons of underlines <laughs> everywhere in the book. Yeah. Um, it, uh, by the way, Tatiana is reading a book that I had just finished a month ago or so. She's in, she's in Russia right now, but She's like, I love reading books that you've underlined because it really shows me what hits you. Mm, that's and so sweet. That's yeah. so sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really sweet. And then I'm like, I hope I, I didn't underline the wrong things. <laughs> right, right, right. Some men that's consider funny. other relationships double. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Exclamation point. Yeah, yeah. Review this later. <laughs> uh, talk to Tatiana about this in the in the column. Um, yeah, you know, at page five, you wrote, uh, what I'm calling for is an approach that elevates the embodied consciousness of men by giving them a structure of practice and growth they can feel immediately and integrate into their daily lives. Hmm. That that was a beautiful, a beautiful way to set the intention and to call forward, of course, what it exactly is. Let me, I'm going to read that one more time not for you, but for those listening in, because I really want this to sink in. What I'm calling for is an approach that elevates the embodied consciousness of men by giving them a structure of practice and growth they can feel immediately and integrate into their daily lives. Let's start with the embodied piece. Um, unpack that yeah. word for us for a minute. Yeah. So embodied means to just have a feeling of awareness of your body. That's the first, you know, like to, to literally feel the whole point of from the core is I'm talking about the, the, the lower abdomen, which is, you know, in martial arts is the dantian, which is the deepest part of the male body, right? For the feminine body, it'd be a womb, the cervix, right? But for men, it's that <clears throat> space between the pelvic floor and the perineum. It's really sort of our sexual power, our you know martial arts. You punch from there. It's it's the real core aspect. So when a man deepens his breath, any human really deepens their breath and starts to bring their awareness to a deeper part of their own body, they're actually felt as more grounded. And then, so that's the first is to literally or to your heart, like bringing an awareness to your heart is an embodied practice. Bringing an awareness to the sensations in your shoulders or your feet. That's an embodied practice, but what it does is it takes us out of the mind, which is you know where we're thinking, 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 and into the experience, the felt and lived experience of the body. Wow. And um, that's the first definition. The second definition, which is a little tiny bit more advanced, is how do you take a trait like love, fierce love is one I use in the book, or uh, grounded consciousness or presence, and rather than just have it be a trait, have it be something that's you're feeling in the body that other people can feel through your body. And so I go through a whole, you know, five-step process of the difference between having present, you know, being present and having presence. And being present is just a, a sort of a mind awareness of your space and the moment and, you know, Eckhart Tolle is the perfect example of this versus literally bringing presence into every cell of your body through breath, through grounding practice, through opening of the heart, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think in a relationship, either with your spouse or your kids, is that the primary objective is feeling, being, experiencing uh, full presence? Well, I think that it's, it's, it's definitely a masculine gift. Yeah. <laughs> it's the gift of the masculine deep, you know, and I hear this from women all the time you know, deep embodied presence actually has an impact on your partners or your child's or your client's or whoever's nervous system. Whereas yes. if you're in your head, in your head, you're going to, through mirror neurons, this is already really, you know, shown, you're going to evoke thinking from them versus yeah. when you're in your body, you're going to evoke them deeper into their, you know, more parasympathetic embodied space. We, we just had, um, 
Do you know Roland McCarty? He's the head scientist for the HeartMath Institute. Oh, no. But yeah, HeartMath is a perfect example of, sure. of how this works. Yeah. He was our trainer for our members for our, our emotional intelligence call. And he talked about feeding the field. And he talked about how this isn't some woo-woo concept of like your vibe in a room. He talks about we can actually measure it. And the collective coherence of a family, right, or a family unit somewhere that a team, a room of people has a, 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 car, a heart coherence collectively. I think that's a, a beautiful notion. That was my yeah. biggest takeaway was, what am I doing to feed the field when I show up for my family each day? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and it, it creates that, it cre you know, the field between your partner um, is, you know, is a very uh, primary field, you know, for people Definitely. in relationships, obviously, right? So yeah, this, your open heart can open the heart of another. It's pretty yes. simple, but, but in practice, it's often, you know, easier said than done. You, you wrote also in the book, you wrote, no true change in behavior or thinking can come without an awakened body, an activated heart, and a spacious mind. Yeah. I love that. What is an activated heart? Uh, it's literal. So when I'm talking about embodiment there, I'm, I'm really talking in a literal space. So I'm talking about bringing energy, breath, awareness, literally using your, your, your embodied will, I guess would be a good way to put mm -hmm. it, to activate and open your heart. So an easy way to do that is you just, you know, drop your shoulders back, lift your sternum slightly, and imagine your heart like getting fuller and fuller and fuller and breathing into it and feeling it and just imagine it kind of expanding out into the space. I mean, there's a hundred other ways to do it, but anything that brings more of your energy, more of your focus, more of your embodied sensation into your heart will activate your heart. <laughs> um, and then you can start to run everything. You know, one of the keys of embodied practice, and this is true for all humans, is that any energy you have that's run through an activated, activated heart gets purified. So even if you have anger or grief mm. or anxiety or anything, if your heart is open and you're, you know, you're not trying to overcome the feeling or get rid of the feeling, but you're bringing the feeling through a, like a, a full activated heart, it changes the whole experience for you and anybody who's with you. How often throughout the day at this point for you, are you consciously, you know, uh, practicing this? How often are you putting your hand on your heart, That's a good question. changing your posture, yeah. taking yeah. a deep breath? Yeah. Dozens. Really? It's, it's an all day, everyday practice. The, the one that's really, you know, active for me right now is because I had a, you know, little cervical spine issue. So I, like everybody was hunched over my phone and over my computer, writing my book for, two, you know, so I had to, so, so, um, pulling the shoulder blades down and back, putting them in my back pocket, lifting my sternum slightly and softening my heart and breath, deepening my breath. Dozens and, and, and more like I, I, I practice throughout the day because the, yeah. because the pressures and the habits of disembodiment are so pernicious. They're so intense, right? Um, our, our, our family, our family history, the stresses of modern life, just our unconscious habits of the body. And so a good way to think about this is if your body is collapsed or your shoulders are forward or your heart is slightly collapsed, your capacity to actually feel, feel love, feel, you know, the space around you, feel empathy, feel all of those things is diminished. Right. But if you lift your heart, Right. And you drop your, you, you expose your chest. Like you can feel more. It's, yeah. it's not fucking rocket science. It's really, and people yeah. can feel you more. Yeah. So I'll, all day I'll, long, man. So yeah. now you're, you're, you're intentionally dropping into your body, reconnecting, establishing, you know, your core. How, how much of the day do you think you're actually there then? So you, you get there, mm. you feel it. How long are you there? And at the end of the day, if it all averaged out, are you present and activated with an activated heart 50% of the day? Or have you thought if about I'm that? If I'm lucky, if I'm lucky, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, I have. And I think most of us are 10% at best, at best. Yeah. And so if I can just make little incremental changes every year, now it's 1% and 2% and, you know, and, you know, 20% and, and just keep 
remembering, it goes from being a temporary state to more of a trait. Yeah. And so I think the way it's happened to me is that I just, it's more of a trait. You know, yeah. presence is more of a trait. Uh, heart awareness is more of a trait. Heart softening is more of a trait. Deep breathing, which helps to activate. I did mention that before, but which helps to activate and relax. Anything that softens your vagal nerve, you know, will help to relax your heart. And anything that puts you into dorsal response, you know, which is a stress response, fight or flight response, will tighten your heart. Yeah. And, and the whole center column, which is basically your, your nerve space, your spine, all the way down to your genitals. So breath is, and I have to say this in the book, like breath is literally the key to all of this. Yeah. Uh, why does it have to be so simple, John? <laughs> <laughs> simple but not easy man i, I feel mean, like an idiot just, when i'm not doing yeah. it <laughs> you can just say you know breathe you know just all day long breathe into your lower abdomen and your whole yeah. fucking life would change yeah that's right yeah and really true right you yeah. know so it's it it, it kind of is that simple and you know and life is life you know you know one of the things that kept hitting me in the book was this idea of numbing and you wrote somewhere i don't remember but you talked about the, the the great plague of the modern man is numbness right yeah and to me that really hit home because i was thinking about all the ways that i'm numbing myself and i swear 16 times while i was reading your book and the book is great it's so well written right i picked up my fucking phone yeah yeah during reading, like while I'm reading your book, and it was so obvious to me how much I go to my phone to numb myself, right? Yeah. Or like, yeah. it, you know, you're writing about something about doing the inner work, and that sense tends to be like maybe a little more of a difficult place for me to hang out than sifting through Instagram, you know, which I go to under the banner of like, do I have any messages? Do I need to connect with anybody? And then all of a sudden, I'm just surfing <laughs> and being entertained wildly. Right. And I, I, you know, even with my family being away right now in, uh, you know, traveling, my, my wife and my two boys are away. I found the tendency to want to just fill my space immediately so I don't miss them, right? How productive can I be? How many people can I hang with? But last night, John, I was, was walking around my house and I thought, I'm just going to walk around and look at things in my home I, I haven't looked at all year. Like, mm. look at a picture on the wall, look at a book on the shelf, look at what, I, like, there's just things I walk by. I, I walk by it every day, multiple times a day. And I will say, I've never looked at that painting ever. Not consciously. Mm -hmm. I never stop mm -hmm. and think about where it came from, why we bought it, anything mm -hmm. about it. I don't look at it. I don't appreciate it. Nothing. It's right there right. in my home. Right. Right. And I thought about how much I numb myself. Can you speak to this numbing that's happening and why that's such a plague? Yeah. Um, well, you know, the, the social media companies, I mean, this has been written about and talked about a lot, sort of found a way to usurp our dopamine system, right? Whereas not that long ago, 20, 30, 40 years ago, you know, we had to do certain things to create dopamine, right? In our bodies. Right? And all of a sudden, here comes this technology that gives us sort of instant dopamine hits. And it's very easy to get addicted to that, you know, in whatever way, watching YouTube videos, watching Instagram, you know, checking financial markets, whatever it is that, 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 you know, that gives you that little, you know, negative or positive, right. Could be tension, but that's also creates a dopamine hit. And so a big reason is, you know, technology has just dropped on us this incredibly addictive um, little device <laughs> on this supercomputer. And and so part of it, I think, is a response to that. Part of it, I think, is a larger um, crisis that men are in, which is, you know, how do I, how do I manage this time in history where the rise of the feminine is, is absolutely happening and, um, and the, um, the masculine is having to reevaluate like their relationship to that. And so a lot of men are, you know, in animosity, you know, to that. Some men are, you know, trying to work with that. I would consider myself one of those people. And so I think there's a modern crisis of, of like, 
what is it what does it mean to be a man you know what does it mean to be masculine what does it mean to give masculinity as a gift what does it mean to you know to lead in our lead ourselves lead our own feminine lead our the feminine in our lives what does all that mean? And I think we're at a really unique time in history and men are feeling the crisis of it. I mean, more men addicted to drugs, more men committing suicide, more men, you know, in celibate, right? More men, like it's just more, it's just a real deep, deep crisis, um, you know? When you look at the men that you have worked with and served over the years, is there a common, is there a common element of numbing that you think is more devastating to a, a an individual than another is it is it porn is it alcohol porn is definitely porn is probably the most egregious yeah, yeah for sure and <clears throat> no and i don't i don't have any judgment about porn right but the way that it's used as this kind of immediate dopamine stress release kind of experience and i've certainly been i went through a period many years ago where that happened with me and 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 it's really, uh, it's just so easy. And, and you can start so young. You know what I mean? You can start, you know, exactly. at, at 12, the moment you get your first cell phone, you can start. And so it's really, it's, it's this, you know, not that, not that <laughs> boys weren't masturbating, you know, throughout all eternity, but sure. they didn't have, you know, serious porn at their fingertips. Right. Yeah, so yeah, so porn is a idea. huge, porn is a huge piece of it. Yeah. But I think it's, I think it's, I think there's actually a, a, a because we've, the, the technology sort of usurped our awareness rather than getting nourished by nature or, you know, masculine relationships or even the mundane beauty of our own life, we're pu constantly pulled to it. Just like your example of while you're reading a book, 20 years ago, that would not have been an option. 30 years right. ago, that would not have been an option. And you would just read the book or you would have kind of stopped reading and looked at the walls you wouldn't have done that so you know there is a bit of a an awareness to the battle we're facing which is we're looking you know i know i don't know how many men consider scrolling through reddit or instagram resting it's not right. or getting nourished yes or relaxing it's not yes. <laughs> so so yeah we, we we really have to awareness is kind of i think what i consider to be the key key issue here yeah you, I shared a, I shared something this morning with my community about, uh, you wrote about on page 41, the four key nutrients. And, mm -hmm. you know, you said the masculine needs four key nutrients for the nervous system to ground and reset, right? The first is time alone with no demands, um, which you wrote is not the same as meditation. The second is mm -hmm. creating time to receive the gifts of the natural world world. Third is time spent in depth and reflection with other men. That's the one I spoke about today because we're on, on the, you know, we're coming up on our, our annual um, event where a hundred guys mm. are going to get together. And I was mm. talking about what you wrote there. And also um, you, you wrote the common trait I see is a struggle to take full responsibility for owning what will refuel their tanks and inspire them to go back to life's challenges. Mm. Right. So how do you take responsibility for your own nourishment? Start by getting clear on your core needs and then commit to filling them like your life depends on it because it does. And, you know, go on to talk about how, of course, you know, um, your capacity to show up with presence and energy with a direct reflection of how much time you take to nourish yourself. And then I remember reading about the fact that not all relaxing activities, maybe you'd say, are numbing. There's there's like this fine line of like, is that numbing? Am I just mm -hmm. distracting myself or am I truly right. recharging and refueling, right? Yeah. So the key to that is consciousness. Are yeah. you consciously like taking a Netflix day because you've been working all day and people have been pulling on you to just zone out to TV can be totally conscious relaxation. I certainly do it, you know, taking a moment to just get lost in social media. If it's conscious, like, okay, I'm, I'm consciously choosing to go into that and just really just get lost in it. Then it becomes then it becomes a, 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 a refueling sort of exercise. But 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 I think that taking a walk, you know, breathing, uh, doing a little yoga, doing doing fifty push ups, you know, and then sitting in a meditate sitting in meditation, just feeling the four corners of the room that you're in, mm -hmm. can create tremendous amounts of relaxation and nourishment. Going and sitting in your fucking yard. Yeah. Taking a sauna, anything that brings you more into the experience of life that is not simply 
kind of losing. So there's quality of nourishment, right? And yeah. and conscious and how consciously are you taking that nourishment that I think is the most important thing. And interestingly, I I also noticed that it's it's paying attention to when the nourishment shows up. Like yeah. If yeah, I eat yeah. something sugary, I might feel that really nourished me, but then later I crash versus if yeah. I don't stimulate myself at all, I might be exhausted because I have yeah. no stimulation and then I take a nap, right? And then that feels yeah. like I'm zapped, but you know, but but hours later, perhaps days later, I've now built strength. Right after a workout, you're exhausted. So did mm -hmm. that sap your energy or is it the type of thing where it's returning yeah. just hours or days or months down the road? Mm -hmm. What time yeah, yeah. frame is the return? Yeah, well, that you know, that's a, I think that's, that's consciousness, an right? Question. Yeah, I, some some guys feel I feel great after a workout. You know what I right. mean? Like, so you might be tired but full and alive. Oh, yeah. So it's not necessarily about being tired or not. It's about how in your body and alive you feel, mm. even if you're exhausted. You know, you can be exhausted and full. You can hit the pillow after a day of really great work and feel full. So I would I would call it more fullness. Mm. You know, like how 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 much can you how much can you fill up on what the natural world has to offer you and what the your life has to offer you. I, I want to talk about I think maybe what would be the opposite of numbness at least for me, which is sensitivity. And <laughs> one of the things that really hit me in the book was. Uh, I remember my parents telling me when I was a kid that I was a really sensitive kid. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't mm -hmm. think that ever became a compliment. <laughs> no. I no. think they, I think I know they meant it that way, kind of, and maybe they didn't, you know, like mm -hmm. yeah. it, it, it certainly didn't feel that way throughout my life. God um, bless them. But when you talked about, you know, sensitivity being like a hunter, being attuned in the woods, they're sensitive to the sounds and the smells and the environment. And so they can be more accurate. If you're attuned yeah. and I like that, that term attunement and, but that's truly like, if you have any type of instrument that's highly sensitive and it can register movement, sounds, colors, smells, and then you can use that as feedback to be able to be more strategic and more accurate perhaps in how you walk through the world. Um, I think that was really wonderful. You know, so I, did I cover that? Did I get that? Yeah, the way a ninja is sensitive. Any? The way a martial artist is, is sensitive is another yeah. way to think about it, right? You're sensitive because your body is alive and attuned. Yeah. And you're sensitive because your body has an awareness that's kind of distinct from the mind. Like we can think about concepts, you know, and think about, you know, I can put my mind, I can think about the center of space. But I can now, if what, the next step is for me to feel the center of space in my body. Or I can think about the shape of this room, or I can actually feel the shape of, you know, use the body mind, not just the mind and to, to become more sensitive. And when I do that, I can feel what's happening in my environment more. How do you think for yourself over the last year, you've increased sensitivity? Um, it's a good question. I think stillness, time alone in nature, like sitting on a rock really like opening the practice of opening body awareness into the space that I'm in. It's incredibly important. And it doesn't, it's a super simple, beautiful practice that doesn't take long and just plugs you in feeling out like in this moment, I'll get, we'll give a little practice that I do in the men's group. So in this moment, this moment's extending out to the end of the universe. And if you start to expand your awareness to feel the moment expanding to the end of the universe, you'll start to feel the cosmos. <laughs> you'll start to feel this time, you know, this moment stretching out to the edges of space. And just that is a nervous system reset. Just that creates more attunement to the present moment. Do people, when you have, when you feel that you have growth in that area, let's say that you've uh, over the last year, you've, you've attuned, you've uh, you sat on that rock, you found stillness, you found space in your environment. Do people feel that from you? Do you have people come to you and say, I sense that I feel that I see a shift in you. Do they reflect that back? Yeah. Yeah. All the time, all the time. And you know, yeah, I mean, I, I get it all the time because I, I teach it and I kind of live it. But, you know, yeah, I think what I prefer is when I see it, when other men in my men's groups see it in each other. 
yeah like start to see it in each other like it's i'm an easy target for that but when i start to see other men go hey like you feel different man like i feel you connected to the ground i feel you i feel your heart more you know i feel your solidity more yes um yeah that's a really beautiful thing to experience and that's kind of what embodiment does that just other modalities of coaching and, and practice, even meditation, lots of kinds of meditation are really just about witnessing mind, right? Witnessing thought, witnessing breath. And that has a certain embodiment quality to it, but there's a whole other set of embodiment possibilities that can be trained, just like we train our bodies to play piano or you know, learn Kung Fu, or, you know, have great sex, you know, all that stuff. It can be trained. When it comes to feedback, um, how, how do you know when your book's successful? What do mm. people say to you? How did people change? What does it look like? Yeah, well, I, you know, I haven't seen that. I can't see them in their daily lives, but they'll underline certain passages and send them to me. And wow, this really, this really hit me hard. This really stuck with me. Mm. Um, this really, you know, this really opened me up, all of those things. And um, yeah, so I just, you know, I just like hearing people's experience and they'll share it on Instagram all the time and I'll share it. And I've gotten a few, you know, a few letters and messages. And so, you know, and I'm, I'm less concerned about, you know, it's not a, it's a small, you know, it's a small offering in a big world, right? So it's really only going to touch a, you know, if I'm lucky, 10, 20, 30,000, 40,000 people, maybe, maybe it'll get legs and start to, you know, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm just glad I did it and put it out there. Yeah. yeah. What do you think shifted in you the most as you, as you wrote it? Was there any core belief that you had going in that as you put pen to paper that really was clarified or evolved? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this concept of the integrated masculine really came to me as I was writing it and talking to my teachers and some other people and like like what is this new paradigm of masculinity and it's really about the integration of our internal feminine which i define as our feeling body our thought body our heart all of the things that are moving and changing and our sensations right so you could call the integration of that of our living body and our consciousness and to feel you know, like the part of you that's never changed and the part of you that's always changing at the same time to make that a meditative kind of all day practice. Um, and, and then to integrate through deep inner work, your own wounds, your own belief systems, your own heartbreaks, all those kinds of things that integrated masculine really felt like an important piece that came to me as I went through. And it's not just about, you know, finding your masculine, like there really is there really is no true masculinity without an integration of our own feminine. And that's a part, that's a, that's an argument I make. That's a big part. statement. I think yeah. that's really, I, th that's a, that's fresh for me. Like mm. I haven't sat with that much. The, mm. Let me say, say that again. There isn't much. There is no true masculinity yeah. without the integration of our own feminine. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. do you, do people, you did a good job in the beginning of the book, in my opinion, talking about, you know, the masculine and feminine definitions that you use. And you said, there's yeah. lots of ways that you can view that. And you did a great job teeing that up. Do people push back on that quite a bit? Oh, all the time. And there's a, there's a, there's a, and usually when they do, they're still conflating masculine and feminine to only mean men and women, only men and women. right? And, and so all the baggage that, that, you know, that come, comes, comes with that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the, the terms masculine and feminine, I talk about this a lot in the book, are really just energetics that each human has. Now, some of us identify more with the part of us that loves freedom, stillness, peace, right? Solitude, right? The masculine in all of us tends to like that, but some of us really like that. And some of us identify more with, you know, love, action, movement, you know, uh, life, you know what I mean? Like we're more, we're more at home in like life than in stillness. And so we both have, <clears throat> we all have both. And it's not, it's not 
gender specific. And, and I think when people push back, it's because they're still making it gender specific, which I understand, but part of my mission in, in my work at least is to look at these polarities as energetic capacities that we can and should expand in both directions and then integrate, if that makes yeah. sense. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Like the capacity to feel you, love. You like ever get tired of just telling people, all right, folks, <laughs> for the 10,000th time. Is yeah, it the one part of your still, work that if like there was a recording that you could just push go, and like have that repeat itself? It's almost a disclaimer that's in every kind of post that I do. Yeah, yeah, I imagine. Yeah. I imagine. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I want to talk, I want to talk for a minute about inspired impulse. Dude, this, this was so good. I, I really, uh, I, this was my meditation this morning, sitting with this term inspired impulse. I feel like right now for me, there may be no more two, two there may be no more two words that are, you know, feeling more powerful to me than these inspired impulse. Yeah. Yeah. You wrote from a place of quiet, deep feeling, let what needs to happen emerge as an inspired impulse rather than a strategy. I often talk about in our community with fathers that people will say, well, what do I do with my kids? And part of why we don't know what to do with our kids, like, should we have that conversation? Should I talk to them about this thing, sex, drugs, rock and roll, what, you know, what's age appropriate is because we don't have, we're not attuned. We haven't felt ourselves. We haven't truly felt into the lives of our children. We haven't established that deep connection. So we're not sure which way to go. But I think that when I read this, I was like from a place of quiet, deep feeling, like that's the reason that we need to have space in our lives you know, so that we know what to do, you know, in the moment we in, you know, Burning Man this year, it was, it was like, we just in flow. Do we go here? Do we go there? I don't know. It was just, we're going to go where we have that inspired impulse. Yeah. And most of the time, you know, and also too, because in Burning Man too, there is a lot of, so feel the, this would be the difference using a Burning Man example. Like you're out on the playa and you're like, oh, let's go here because that place is going to be going off, all right? Let's go to whatever it was, Mayan Moria, or let's go to this place, right? Because that's, we're going to get something that we think we need from that place. Yes. And there is a flow that happens at Burning Man, but, but versus like really getting quiet in the midst of all that chaos and like letting what needs to emerge emerge and it might be go to mayan warrior it might be drive out into the middle of the playa and you know make out with my wife it might be you know go sit in the dark you know it could come but it comes it doesn't come from the thinking mind it comes from that state of still feeling expansiveness so that something that needs to happen can happen how does inspired impulse show up for you in your daily life Mm. Yeah, well, it's a, so <clears throat> all of these practices, let me put this disclaimer, all of these practices are practices of failure and recommitment. Mm. Presence is a practice of failure and recommitment. Heart openness is a practice of failure and recommitment. You know, trying to have, you know, mindful leadership in your relationship is a practice of failure and recommitment. And that this one in particular is a practice because we're so strategy driven. Mm -hmm. the, the, the old paradigm of masculinity is about winning. It is about accumulating. It is about, you know, those, it's about that kind of, you know, the accumulation of wealth and power, quite frankly, right? And, and keeping that, right? Even if it means keeping our partner from being angry at us, or even if it means, you know, you know, so there's so much that the masculine is so wired to win in whatever area you, you you name it. So this is a relaxation of that impulse and allowing a true heart wisdom to emerge from the body. And that requires stillness. So I will often sit on my little couch right there <laughs> and and just wait and breathe and try not to do anything. It's actually counterintuitive because you do nothing in order to wait for the next something to emerge. Yeah. 
Yeah. Do you and ever? It's so counterintuitive for men. And, and what I will do, just to you know answer your question a little more fully, a few times a week, I will literally sit and do nothing, not meditate, not write, not check my phone. I'll sit for thirty minutes, an hour. And I'll just allow whatever wants to emerge. Sometimes it's feelings. Sometimes feelings I need to feel. Sometimes it's like, a oh, I want to do this. Or, oh, I need to take care of this to be in more integrity. So that the, the capacity for a, a man, a, you know, the masculine, but I'm going to say a man in particular, to be able to sit and do nothing and wait for the deeper impulse to emerge is a very deep and often difficult practice. You know, I had written down a, a question of wanting to know your take on balancing healing versus growing, mm. right? How, how we know when we're operating from our core, how are, we, how, are we, how are we knowing when our core needs more healing and when our core needs to be activated, engaged, and growing, which mm. I don't, mm. maybe mm. that's the wrong question. Maybe there's no, a No, 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 that's question. a great question. That's a great question. So simultaneously both right? But healing is more of a thera- more in the realm of therapeutic, right? So therapists or groups that we're part of or processes that we're part of or other sort of modalities that are meant to, you know, release trauma, rewire our thinking, you know, all of those things are, are more therapeutic in nature and incredibly necessary. And <clears throat> yogic or meditative or martial, you know, pick your words, right, is about expanding capacity, so the capacity to feel behind you, for example, feel the room behind you is a, is a trained capacity. The, the capacity to open your heart to your partner, it's a trained capacity. The capacity to you know do all the things we're talking about here. These are trained, literally you're training the body to be more as an instrument of love and consciousness. That is a different thing than healing. Now, both need to happen if somebody just heals but they're, they don't really go to expand their capacity, okay, they'll hit a limit and they won't really learn, you know, they won't, they can't be all they can be, you know, but, or if they just learn the yoga capacity, and this is what I see a lot happening in my work is men will learn the yoga capacity. I've certainly been going through this myself my whole life, um, but they don't heal. They don't do the deep inner work, as I say in the book, then, um, yeah, then there's a, there's a, there's a imbalance, right? So both have to happen simultaneously throughout our lives. Now, sometimes one is more important than the other. Sometimes healing just is calling to happen and you have to heal, but, but really working both simultaneously is like, it's like doing, you know, it's like saying, if I just did my upper body, you know, okay, great. You're going to, you know, <laughs> but you won't, you know, your legs won't be strong or vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. John, I just I'm using, this. trying to use dude, dude analogies. No, here, no, no, right? no, it's great. They I can really hit. You yeah. know, it's interesting. I'm sitting here and I'm like, you know, I love, I've been in the room now, you know, several times where you've been teaching and people are asking questions and, and, and you, it seems that you, you always have a story, uh, an example, you know, you, it's like, you've done the work and I was laughing on the way still home. Still doing the work. Still, yes, still yes, very yes, much doing yes. It. Yeah, yeah. But, and you have done a tremendous amount of work. I was, I was laughing um, with Emily when we had left your place and we, you and I were sitting on the back and Adam said to you, what's the difference between consciousness and awareness or something to that effect? And it was like, you, you gave an answer that was like, you had thought about this for six hours already. <laughs> and I was, I was laughing with Emily on the way home. Um, about this, um, be, because you, I, I re- this is a hat tip to you, by the way. I'm, I'm Thank referencing you. the fact that you're, you've done so much work. I really, it's, a, it's a hat tip, and a, maybe a fun question in here is that, are you ever in a, have you, do you recall being in a situation in the last year or two where somebody asked you a question and you're just like, I have no fucking idea. <laughs> Have you been stumped lately or what question well, well is more stumping than, yeah, the great John yeah. Wineland? Okay, this is that's a great question. I appreciate it. It's the one, you know, it's also very personal too, right? It's the one uh, that's kind of the the marriage of the two two areas we just talked about, right? So healing um the question is how do I not be reactive in the in the face of being attacked, 
is the big one that men struggle with. And I definitely have struggled with this, right? And, and even though, you know, I'm a teacher of this, holding space, all this kind of stuff, I still, you know, get poked and collapse. Absolutely. And so it's the real world stuff of like, how do I stop that from happening? I don't want to be reactive when she's, you know, coming at me. I don't want to be reactive with my kids. I don't want to be, you know, and even though I know the answer, the answer is to, you know, do some, you know, there's lots of different ways to do it. Grounding, shaking. I mean, I can give you a dozen embodied practices to do it. Do yeah. I always do it? No. Do men I've taught this stuff always do it? No, because it's so, it's so ingrained, you know, our fight or flight and our, just our humanity. Yeah. So I think that's the question that has, you know, stumped me in my personal life and my practice, you know, and also that I see stump men who really want to, who totally. want to love well, who want to love better, who want to be able to stay in the state of open-hearted equanimity, but just can't when she's doing this or sure. when this is happening, right? Yeah. Do, do you experience shame when you- When I can? Like, react again, you know, and yet you've of thought course, it through, yeah. you teach it, yeah. you- Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, just a, I'm just a guy, right? You know, I had my own trauma in my life and- my body's still working through that. I'm still very much healing it. And, you know, the thing that I am really good at, I'd put myself in an upper echelon here is I'm really great at repair. Mm. You know, if I snap, then I'll be like, look, I'm sorry. That was, you know, I kind of, da, 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 da. and then I'll get to a deeper truth. So I'm really good at the repair piece. I've learned that, you know, yeah. plus I'm an eight. I don't know if you know the Enneagram scale, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I'm an eight. Yes. So I'm the fucking challenger. I mean, like I'm, and I, you know, and, and, you know, it's just in my nervous system. I'm fiery, I'm challenging. And so, you know, I have a lot of energy so I can, I can overwhelm people and, you know, and even, you know, people feel either, you know, pressed or bullied or, you know, I'm like, and I, and I have to really be aware of that. And I feel like I've done an okay job of that, but there's always better. There's always more. So I feel, I wouldn't say so much shame as just regret and just yes. like, fuck, you know, when, when am I going to, when's that one going to change? What's your formula for repair? Um, putting myself in their experience mm. and owning where I'm wrong. Dude, totally. I mean, to, yeah, to just to just say, here's a great tool to give your your you guys some a tool. Here's where you're right. I was an asshole when I did that, or I can understand why you'd be pissed that I'm being selfish, or I can understand, you know, why you would be angry that I didn't dot dot dot. Right. And, and so here's where you're right. And then when you start with that, just to give a little caveat to the brothers here, then when you say, and this part doesn't feel true to me, mm. you've got a lot more cred <laughs> yes. than, you know, than if you started with, you know, what the fuck. Totally. Yeah. You know, one of the most impactful meditations that I've done in the last year or two is I sat down one morning and I said, for the next half hour, I'm going to walk through Tatiana's life. Mm. Um, yeah, for anybody who's Beautiful. listening, yeah, that's new here. It's, so 16 years married and I sat down, I was like, I'm just going to walk through her life. I'm going to imagine, I'm going to feel literally putting myself in the space of like where she grew up, the country she grew up in, the apartment she grew up in. And she grew up in a one bedroom apartment with her mom and her grandma. Her, her grandma mm. was in the bed, her mom was in the living room and she was in the kitchen. Like mm. that was her world growing up and then moved to the States when she was 17, went to college and, you know, in Athens, Georgia. And then you know, it's just, I just was trying to walk through what's it like to arrive in the States and not speak English, you know, which is where she was. And I've never felt that. I heard the words, like I heard her say that I could tell the story of her timeline. But I never felt her timeline. Yeah. 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 That's a beautiful practice of empathy, right? Yeah. We tend to, we tend to forget that empathy is a skill set that can be increased and yes. our capacity to be empathetic can be expanded. It's, you know, a lot of guys who, especially guys who are kind of more, just more dense in their nervous systems, not dense here, but like just dense nervous systems. They really have to work on that. Yeah. You know, like I said, I was raised with five women. So I kind of learned my body, my young body learned sort of the feeling aspect of life a little more than most. But a lot of guys who didn't have that, they really, the empathy piece really, really stumps them. Like, yeah. How do I feel what she's feeling? <laughs> well, totally. you just kind of put yourself in her life. Like you, you practice it. 
yeah. you practice it. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. What a what a beautiful practice. John, I, you know, I want to be respectful of the time. Um, so I'm probably not going to make it through the other 17 questions <laughs> I wanted to ask you. Good. But do you have a burning one? Do you no, have, do you no, have no. Well, my burning one is this. I, you know, I do want to ask a question, which is, you know, the the book, the book has it's a. I, 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 it almost sounds like a poke at the book. It's not. It's a lot. It's a mm. lot. It's a it's a lot to consider. Yeah. There's a lot of. Um, there's a lot of ways to view things. There's you're dealing with complex. Well, I see it as complex subjects, and you're bringing clarity to them and definitions to them. And I really appreciate that. If somebody were to only be able to read a chapter, or if somebody were only able to get an idea from the book, what might be the one that you think, mm. if that's even possible to answer, that they should take away? Yeah. Well, it depends. Is this person a man? Yes. Okay. So if this person is a man, I would say the the chapter on men's work, men's groups. Yeah. I would I would say start there. You know, surround yourself with a group of deep men that you trust, and that will attune your nervous system to really, um, yeah, to 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 you know, to a, a deeper place, right? Assuming they're deep men, you know, and they're not just you know, you're not everybody yeah. out just getting getting high or drinking or you know what I mean or, but but that you're you surround yourself with deep men who who were who were contemplating the things that we're talking about today that that would be the one place the second one because i'll throw the second one would be the one on breath yeah. chapter on on the importance of breath can you yeah. speak quickly to the men's groups from two angles one you're i know you're in a group mm -hmm. where right you you have surrounded yourself with a group of men yeah. who are there for yeah. each two. other I'm, and, in, I'm in two <laughs> yeah, and two you also lead you lead yeah. groups so yeah. Yeah. yeah talk to me about how both of those are set up in your world. Just give us a little peek into them. Well, one, because it, I think the human element of seeing you in a group as a member is powerful, but also I think there are people that would be interested in what you're doing as a leader of yeah, groups yeah. that may want to yeah, think deeper. Thank in. you. So um, my personal group is a, a group of men who are leaders and most of them are leaders or teachers or coaches in this world. And I wanted to surround myself with a group of peers. In fact, both groups that I'm in, one was LA based, which is where I came from. One is, you know, primarily Austin based. Um, we, you know, we circle up at the same time every other week. We're just, we're just really, you know, um, and we, we practice for an hour, right? The format is we practice, do the embodied practice, breath work, any kind of practice for an hour. We rotate leadership. So not one person is leading it. And then we have a feedback circle which we, you know, where we, we work with one man or multiple men to really support them. And that, you know, for the last 13 years of my life, I've, that's basically what I've had. And that's been my touchstone for everything in my life. The ones I lead, I lead a, a six month embodied men's training, which is a kind of a deep dive into everything we're talking about it starts in January. It's all, it's, it's already sold out for next year, but I, I run it every year. Um, and, and then I also run a teacher training for people who literally want to, you know, get into this work and teach this work. Um, so my professional one has been, you know, it's just basically one big gnarly, you know, beautiful group. We go out into the desert. We go out to Death Valley every spring and we set up sort of a camp, like a, it's like a burning man for men's group. We set up a camp. We, you know, we literally camp outside. We, you know, we, it's, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful experience. We practice under the stars. It's, it's amazing. So those are the two kinds of groups I run. Um, I think if people would want more, just if they want more of this content or what I'm talking about, I have a streaming service called the virtual workshop, which is clips of the last 10 years of workshops. I've done tons of these practices that I'm telling you about lots of men's masculine practice, lots of feminine practice, lots of couples practice. And so that would be a way if they want to get a little more information or a little more kind of rather than go just beyond reading a book, but they actually want to get into the practice of stuff. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that, John. Um, yeah. Yeah. Man, uh, is there anything you want to say, buddy? Is there anything that you just want people to mm. know? That I, I mm. didn't ask the question. Mm. Uh, yeah. Blank canvas here. You could just pick up whatever yeah, color, me, pick me, up whatever me, brush. Let me pull the inspired impulse. Yeah. So 
when men start, when, when, when men read my book or read David Data's book, David was my teacher for many years, read The Way of the Superior Man, or they read those kinds of books that really talk about these high level possibilities of being as a man. It's often real easy to forget that, that, that these are pretty lofty to live with feet, sensitivity and consciousness is a long-term lifelong sort of meditative and yogic practice. Um, just like being a great martial artist or being a great anything. And so I just would caution men to get too caught up in the needing to be more masculine or wanting to be the masculine or, you know what I mean? Like it, it, that, that, that has, that is, has a, it's a, more of a straight jacket than actually a, a, a path to liberation. And so, so I would just really caution men as they step into this work to step into it as fully flawed humans who are trying to expand their capacity and experience healing in a group of brothers, hopefully, hopefully. Um, so I would hold these things, hold all these concepts loosely. <laughs> I'm still working on them. I'm still making mistakes. I'm still learning and, you know, and, uh, but, you know, but, but make a commitment. You know, if you want to expand your capacity, you got to get on the mat. That's you right. want to, you know, you, you got to. So, so it's one of those things you can't think your way into a deeper capacity. Yeah. Yeah. John, I wanted to save this one last uh, question, this uh, one last piece of your life to the end. Mm -hmm. um, and I know this is, uh, this is, there's a lot of love here in this one piece that I, I want to bring up. Yeah. Um, I'd love to talk about Claire um, yeah. as we, as we conclude our conversation today. Uh, by honoring her here in the final conversation. And I, I wonder if you can share with our brothers, um, you know, a little bit about Claire's life and, uh, and your relationship to Claire. Yeah, yeah. Well, Claire was my daughter who died four years ago, 21. She had cystic fibrosis all of her life. And, um, and so we knew that her life was going to be shorter than most people's. And so uh, she was the love of my life, uh, still is to this point. And, um, and I doubt that'll be challenged. And, um, and she was just an amazing soul. Like she, 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 ran, uh, she ran a foundation to help other kids with cystic fibrosis um, called the Claire's Place Foundation. She did three TED Talks. She spoke around, she traveled around the world to speak on behalf of other kids with special needs. She lived an incredibly full and beautiful life. And she packed more into 21 years than, you know, all this while spending a third of the year in the hospital every year, you know? And she packed more into her 21 years of living than most people do in 70. So yeah, just, you know, just, I mean, I've done so much grieving around her and I've come to peace with her. But, um, but I appreciate you bringing her up. And if anybody wants to know more about her, they can just Google Claire Wineland. There's two documentaries and a bunch of other information about her and our foundation. And John, any thoughts for the men out there who have children who are battling life-threatening mm. illnesses or, or maybe, mm. maybe have lost a child? Mm. Well, if they've lost a child, then, you know, I, I feel you, brother. It's like the, it's the, it's the, most agonizing pain I've ever experienced. And um, and just having a kid with special needs is such a tender, painful gift, you know, because it requires you to be more present, to be more attentive, to not take every day for granted. I would say that's the thing that I thought we did pretty well is we just didn't take time for granted. Like we got stuff done. She wanted to travel, we traveled. I would take her with me to Europe to teach. I would, you know what I mean? Like I, you know, we, we got into like living now. And, and I think the thing that Claire would want me to say is, you know, like, don't, don't treat your kid with special needs or any children with special needs. Um, don't pity them. Don't pity them because her big message was, you know, I don't, I don't want to be pitied. I, I, I love my life. I wouldn't change anything in my life. Of course, I'd like to be healthy, but like, this is like, this is my life. And pitying a kid with special needs is a cert, is a way of disempowering them. And so I, I, I'm certain that's what she would want me to tell parents. 
Well, John, thanks for mentioning that. And, and if they wanted to donate to her foundation again, can you mention where they might? Yeah, do that? it's called Claire's Place Foundation. And what we do is we um, we literally we literally funnel money from whoever donates, right, and into a, a a fund that delivers money to families and children with cystic fibrosis that are struggling with extraordinarily long hospital uh, stays, double lung transplants, trying to you know kids with CF that are trying to go to college, kids with CF that are trying to like move out on their own and kind of establish you know. So, so the fund is really a beautiful way to just funnel money directly into, uh, you know, families and, and children that need them. Because this, this disease affects kids and, and young adults. Most of them don't live too long. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, to anybody who is inspired to donate Claire's Place Foundation, you can get all the information. John, thank you for the conversation today. Yeah, I this is say, good, John. Again, that I feel just deeply grateful that I have this opportunity to spend time with you in, in the ways that we have. Um, grateful for your work. That's no doubt made a difference uh, in my life and for many individuals who've found you. Um, mm -hmm. I knew about you prior to meeting you because somebody that I know was being transformed by your work. Mm -hmm. And what was what's really great when you, you meet the author and you meet the teacher and you find that person. And what you find is this extremely human individual standing in front of you, somebody who you feel has deep wisdom and at the same time, great humility. And that's exactly the energy that I felt from you was um, a lot of, you know, I could feel the work that you had done through the way that you spoke and the way that you viewed the world. And I also saw that intentional curiosity showing up at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that makes you very approachable. I think that's, um, I'm, and I'm just reflecting to you what I see and why I love John Wineland, the man. So thank you, John. Thank you man. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much, man. It's really great having this conversation with you. I, I appreciate it. I hope it's helpful. Men, I'm going to encourage you to go pick up this book. Um, we'll put it in the show notes, link to it here from the core, a new masculine paradigm for leading with love, living your truth and healing the world. Uh, we only scratched the surface here today, men. You know, we only scratched the surface. There's so much wisdom in this book. And, um, if you, if you're watching on YouTube, you can start to see, by the way, like all of my underlining that I was doing in the book, uh, Tatiana should get a hold of this one. She'd really appreciate it. So right on. Right on. Um, congratulations again, John, and, and thank you for being here today. Thank you, John. A lot of fun.